Hi, everybody. This is Augie. I am the president of the board of directors here at B-Class and also one of the co-hosts here at Queer Book Club, uh, an event that we do monthly. And in case you missed it out, we're here on our YouTube channel, so you get a chance to meet the author. With me, I have my co-host, Mikey, and our January guest author, Jennifer Baumgartner. I'd like for both of you to introduce yourselves. I'll start off with Jennifer. Sure. So thank you, first of all. Um, I'm Jennifer Baumgartner, as you said. I'm a writer and publisher, documentary maker, kind of feminist, all things feminist and publishing. Uh, I live in New York City for the last 30 years, and I'm originally from Fargo, North Dakota. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. Go for it, Mikey. Thank you, Augie. Thank you, Jennifer. My name is Mikey. I'm one of the two co-founders of Bisexual Queer Alliance Chicago and the other co-host of Queer Book Club. And I am grateful that Jennifer is here because I read her book and it inspired me to become the first by liaison at Center and Halstead and asked Ed if you'd want to be co-founders. And that's how Bisexual Queer Alliance Chicago was founded. So Jennifer is one of the matriarchs. I know. I'm so amazed by that. Thank you so much. Jeez. Uh, you don't know where where your seeds will land, but that's really wonderful. So we all have our coming out story and being bisexual, we have to tend to come out multiple times. So I'm just curious to know like, what was one of your first coming out stories? It was coming out to my parents for sure. So I was living in New York City. I had been here for about a year. I was 23, working at Ms. Magazine, and I fell in love with like one of the other young intern types there. And she had already had a girlfriend. She was a little more experienced. And um, I, I just sort of, you know, my parents weren't asking like, are you dating anyone? It wasn't that I was lying, but it was a sin of omission. I just felt like by not telling them that this big thing is going on in my life. I am lying. And what does that mean about me and my ability to handle this? And like, you know, I, I think I was kind of like freaked out by the home, like knowing that I had any fear was also upsetting. And so um, I wrote a letter to my mom and mom and dad, but it happened, I timed it in a poor way. Well, first of all, why did I not call? That was like, I wrote a letter like it was, you know, the 1700s and it happened to arrive right around Mother's Day, like the day before Mother's Day. And my mom thought it was a Mother's Day card. And it said it was like, I need you to know that I'm bisexual and Anastasia. Blah, blah. And so when we talked, she was a little put off, but not because of that. She was like, I thought you were going to send me a card. And then there was no card. And said there was this letter. And I might be getting this wrong, but I remember she was like, and the only bisexual person I can think of is Elton John. And he seems unstable. And so she had this sort of like weird sort of word cloud of associations, but they were kind of funny. And I did feel it it really wasn't a bad conversation. And I saw how like my own fear had driven this sort of bizarre conversation. And that was the best I could do at the time. Um, but, you know, it's something we can laugh about now. And so in a way it was funny, but it was also, it was like really high stakes to me, like talking to them on the phone. I was like heart pounding. How are you guys? Uh, for me, I came out a little over four years ago. Um, it was to my then girlfriend who had been out as a bisexual for at the time over 20 years. And she was happy that I came out here. I, I grew up in a very religious home. So dealing with all that and then rewiring my brain and then eventually just figuring out my own identity. And then I bumped into b -Quack just looking for community and found my own queer tribe, you know, missed all that. And then b -Quack somehow found its way back to me. And I was asked to join the board as a general board director back in 2020, obviously the pandemic hit, and then became vice president and currently the president of the board of directors. Um, it, it's been awesome to discover my own identity and, you know, also like eventually came out to my parents and my own uh, brothers and my sister on Facebook during Pride Month back in 
2018. And everybody knew that I was bisexual at that time. And then all my friends that were queer just came out of the woodworks and they were happy for me. So that was really, really cool. But yeah, that's my story. How about you, Mikey? Wow. Uh, first, because of all the trauma I've been through, I thought I was straight. And then I was abused by other people and I thought I was gay. So I came out gay and bad. <laughs> I finally met the love of my life, who was non-binary. And I thought, oh, uh, okay, I'm not straight. I'm not gay. I'm not asexual. And then after reading your book, okay, I'm bisexual. And then after asking Ed to be co-founder, I'm actually queer. So I'm the queer co-founder of Bisexual Queer Alliance Chicago, and Ed is the bisexual. So I came out many different times at different, yeah, it was, but the question I have is, you do documentaries as well. And um, the word survivor also came out to myself. I finally came out a survivor. Can you talk about some of your documentarian work? Yeah, thank you. Um, I So uh, I've made two documentaries. The first one was called I Had an Abortion. And it, it kind of started in 2004. I had been working as a journalist for you know, 10 years at least. And I wrote stories, kind of the feminist beat. So I wrote stories for magazines, a lot about abortion rights, basically, but they would all be sort of about like activists said this versus this and this, you know, they were just very polarized and very, um, they weren't about the actual experience and then the person and the story that leads to that experience. And, uh, and, and, and also, I guess I was starting to get tired of hearing everybody's strong opinions, but no one had had an abortion, you know, like no one would speak from, from personal experience. And so um, I decided to do this project where I just asked people for their abortion stories, male or female. Um, they did not have to have any party line or I didn't really want to hear the politics. And I was amazed. People sent me letters, you know, so many people wanted to share because it was a story that was really bottled up. So even though we talk about abortion all the time, we don't, talk about it that way. And we don't allow, like, we're not like a compassionate, active listener of that story often enough. And that really relates to rape too, which was my second documentary it was called, it was rape. And people have a lot to say about rape and two rape survivors. Um, but it's so rare, it, you know, either trying to make them feel better or, you know, whatever, or, or, you know, distance themselves from that possibility by, trying to figure out the things that they did that the other person doesn't do. But it's so rare to just listen to the whole story, including the, the internalized um, sense of, of, um, of complicity that many, many rape survivors feel, and including and compassionately seeing this moment that's very vulnerable, which is often the humiliation, the feeling of humiliation around it. And just being able to pr provide a space where, as a witness, you can take in that story. You don't have to do anything else. And so that's what I did for that documentary. And it was very, you know, uh, I wasn't, I'm, I'm feeling pretty confident about it now because it all worked out as I was doing it. Because again, a lot of people came to me with their stories. I didn't have to search too hard. But sometimes people think they want to tell something and they're not necessarily ready or it isn't necessarily going to feel okay. I think specifically around sexual abuse, it's not going to necessarily feel okay to have it be public because it, it could potentially be a violation in a way that I just didn't feel was coming up with the abortion stories. Like it was like people, like they needed that cork to come out of their bottle, like they were dying to tell the story. So I was worried about that, that I was, misreading like sometimes in an, in an attempt to when you've been out of control and had your control taken away from you an attempt to get control over it can be disclosing and talking and that was the thing i was very worried about inadvertently exploiting but when the there were many opportunities for everybody who was interviewed to back out there was just never a moment where I wanted anyone to do something they didn't want to do and where we ended up, even though I think it has a lot of raw moments that are very surprising for people to watch. 
um, in terms of what's being revealed, it it worked. And the people who were in it were happy to be in it. And the reason I say raw moments that people aren't used to seeing is even though I think people talk about rape and sexual assault a lot now, and there have been quite a few documentaries, it's really often very cursory in, and, and presented in terms of like predator and prey. Like there's these victims and here's the people who groom them and the predators and whether it's set at a college campus or whatever, or, or Harvey Weinstein, like there's just like this kind of this element of flattening um, where we need maybe not the perfect victim anymore, but we definitely still need the perfect perpetrators. And that was the thing I stayed away from. Like, I mean, I didn't interview perpetrators, but if I did, I would ask them all these things about their lives. And at the end, not because I was trying to angle it that way, there's no way you wouldn't feel some compassion <laughs> because you're listening to a person talk about how they've become the person they've become, you know, uh, as long as they weren't trying to justify the harm they've done. I think you would be like, oh, good. So, you know, no, we're not like born rapists, you know, I assume. Um, so anyway, so yeah, so that's what those two, two uh, documentaries are. And they're quite, simple in their approach, but, um, and sometimes it's the hardest thing to get. It's just a space where somebody feels safe enough to tell their story. Yes. The reason I asked that is Augie, our current president at Bisexual Queer Alliance Chicago is a filmmaker as, as well and a documentarian. So, and that documentary that you did, um, somebody saw it. And um, I learned that um, there's a difference between being a survivor and rape and adult consenting sexual orientation. And that's what I always had to fight. Uh, Am I this way because of that? They're two different things. Yeah. So thank you once again for being an inspiration. Well, thank you. It's my, it's my honor. What are your documentaries or what are you making? Uh, for me, I did a documentary about the organization. It's Humble Beginnings with Mikey and Ed starting it. Um, and then eventually just showed how we went from in person to dealing with a pandemic via Zoom to a hybrid format and where we were at and how we're, we've grown a lot in the last 12 years being an organization so you could definitely check that out on our youtube channel i also did a quick little documentary about our other boy uh blood and late co-founder ad as well that you could also check out on the youtube channel so that um those were a couple documentaries that i've done in the last two years and then when it comes to my own work i'm on my own YouTube channel, I'm just doing a lot of like tutorials, filmmaking, on filmmaking and um, different random blogs, you know, my own life. And then i um, looking to get back into producing short films and feature length films. Uh, there's a part of my life where I used to be a huge partier and then also ended up bouncing and bar backing. So I'm thinking about potentially creating a memoir on that and then adapt it into a screenplay and then eventually make it into a feature length film. I know it's going to be cathartic once I start the process, mm -hmm. but once it's out in the other, I'll be stoked to like present it to folks and have other people collaborate with me on that effort. Cool. That sounds great. Thanks. What's the working title for the, for the bouncer barback? I think I'm going to call it Last Call. Oh, that's good. So, <laughs> so yeah, we'll, we'll see where that goes. I still have to write notes and figure out characters that I want to have within my life. Obviously, change their names for the privacy of those individuals, both mm -hmm. living and not living. But, yeah, I'll be excited for that. But, yeah, um, going back to you know, those two documentaries and talking about rape and abortion, like those are two hot, hot and debated and talked about subjects. So the fact that you went for it is just amazing. 
And yeah, that leads me to my next question. I know Mikey during our actual program had mentioned this about your book, Look Both Ways, Bisexual Politics, and how it meant to him. So I want him to share essentially what that book meant to him during that time of his life. And then how was your writing process for that as well? But I'm going to let Mikey go for it and then feel free to jump in afterwards, Jen. Yeah, it was difficult to find myself surviving and knowing what I knew. I was my own worst enemy. And then when I picked up Jennifer's book, I realized that I empowered myself and I have the right to do so. And, um, I became the first bio liaison at Center and Halstead. I would not have the courage to do that without the book. And then I asked Ed to be co-founder of Bisexual Caroline Chicago once again because of the courage of both. Uh, so Jennifer's our matriarch. And um, thank you, Jennifer, very much for your book. Well, that was such a beautiful thing to share with me, as as I've told you. And um, really, really meaningful because sometimes I forget um, Sometimes I forget almost about the book because I'm old now <laughs> or whatever. Like, you know, I wrote it and it feels like a long time ago. And, and even though I still think about these things all the time, I'll sort of be like, did, what did I write? And what did I know? Like, I'll kind of like question myself. And I feel that way about all of my books. Like, it's, it's almost scary to like open them up and be like, what was I a totally different person and an idiot when I wrote this? You know, like, that's the fear. Um, and, and yet every time I do open them up, I always see things like, no, this is, oh, that's maybe a little dated or whatever, but yeah. And that's maybe something you can continue to build on with your thinking now. And just to sort of see it as, as an iteration. Um, and also in a nice way, a little time capsule of like, this was what, where I was with this then. Um, and I'm a little I don't disavow any of it, but I'm in a slightly different place, as I was saying earlier during our conversation, because I'm able to, I have such a deeper understanding of trans identity and the way it, it intersects and overlaps with my concepts around bisexuality, at least. Um, but the writing process, you know, it was difficult the way writing is. Like, I got the book deal, and that's always fun. So you like, you write your proposal and then it sells. And then they like give you the first half of the advance and that's all like just fun. And then I usually sort of dither for a long time and put it off and do other things like write magazine articles or whatever. And then when it's starting to be due, then I kind of turn my attention to it. And that's the way I've always been. I'm kind of a last minute worker. Um, but you're thinking and cogitating and like taking in information and making notes the whole time. But I there's usually the moment of writing is pretty ugly for me. And the first draft is sort of, pretty incoherent and not very funny and you know, like, you know, all the sorts of things you want in there to make it be readable. I won't well have gotten to, but in most of my books, and I think it's because I was still doing magazine profiles back then a lot. I'm really dependent on, um, I love interviewing people and I'm really dependent on interviews. And I was looking at this and remembering like, Oh, that's right. I did a gazillion in-person interviews with people who are bisexual. Some of them I'd forgotten. I'd even ever met, you know, like, you know, kind of to me, famous people that I was sort of like, oh, that's right. We sat down and had this long interview and they're in here and I captured it. And, um, and I think that part of it, like getting those interviews and then transcribing them and kind of living with those people's voices and kind of choosing the quotes or whatever, um, was what enabled me to have a real structure in so far as, as it, it does have a structure. And I'm not that, uh, type A where I need things to like have a, a really specific structure. It just needs to go here and hang together and I thought of it as sort of chronological, but also um, also sort of building toward this idea of like, well, why I'll start in the beginning saying about how bisexuality is so maligned and why would that be? And what's the history of it? And what's the threat there? But then at the end, I was sort of like, well, what's the like, let's turn the thing that we think is bad about it on its head. What's the opportunity there? And at the time, I don't think I would use this word now because it's just so out there and used in a different way. But I was saying that the idea of being clueless and privileged, meaning not being your own worst enemy, like the good side of walking into a room and being like, I belong here, or my experience of dating is, of course, you hold hands, you know, in public. There's an element of having been used to having things that enabled 
the at least the public representation piece of queer politics to be pushed forward a little bit, I think. And I think also that's where like the drag queen trans thing with Stonewall comes into play because if you can't hide it, in this case, it wouldn't be because of privilege. We'd be like, if you're all, always being identified as queer because of not being able to pass in, in you know, your gray flannel suit as man or something, then you, you never have that opportunity to hide. You're, you know, you're not in the closet. So that's not an option for you. And so what's the what's the uh, privilege that comes with that or what's the freedom, at least, that comes with that? So I mean, and I'm still interested in those ideas of, uh, I, you know, I, I, I never want to be in a position of being like, oh, well, the cool part of being privileged and ignorant is X, because I think it's obviously does more damage to even the, everyone, you know, but even the privileged person to wallow in their ignorance. But um, in the case of bisexuality, when you're aware that there's some sort of threat or social cost to being queer, but you could still bring that part of you that's like, but no, I refuse because I'm used to living this way or whatever. I do think that there's a little element there. And I, I was thinking about like why, because my whole, you know, that Buddhist phrase, the way I think it's Buddhist, the way you do one thing is how you do everything. I always sort of triangulate, like I'm really scared of getting sucked into either vortex of anything, you know? So I always want to have like, one flag over here and one flag over here. And I want to hover and I don't want to have to get flattened out into this, what anybody says this role is or what the rules are of this role. And I don't want to get flattened out into the rules of this role. And I don't think I'm like so wildly um, like unique or out there, but I am really like what weirdness I have or what desire I have not to conform is really strong in me. Um, and so I am always kind of doing those things. And I think that's why the, the desire to talk about rape or abortion or whatever, things that are very common, but get sort of treated like they almost happen to no one um, is that sort of thing is very, it's like, I think that's why I'm drawn to those sorts of stories is this idea of like, I don't want to be in the silence. Uh, and I also don't want to, and the silent majority. And I also don't want to be sucked into this flattened role that someone else is putting on me of this experience i want to be i don't want to be tethered <laughs> to those things also it kind of leads me into my last and final question uh we like to ask all of our authors that are part of queer book club um do you have any future projects that you're currently working on that you're excited about yeah i mean one thing i'm working on that i've been working on for about a year is a book of correspondence, um, letters between Bessie Head, who's a Matswana um, writer who died in, in the 80s. And she was quite important, but she's been, she's not well known enough. And, uh, and she had a five-year correspondence with this housewife, um, social worker, kind of normal white lady in upstate New York. Um, and it's just, it, it, talk about time capsule. It's such a time capsule of the mid seventies and this decade of profound change for women and women's roles, but they're writing across difference too. So somebody living in Southern Africa, somebody living in upstate New York, um, Bessie Head never knew her parents. She was living, she was born in apartheid South Africa, white mother, black father. That was against the law, you know, like kind of a typical or, you know, what's typical, but like, you know, what white male class lady. And so in all of the ways in which they were, connected and um, the ways in which, you know, on a superficial level, they were quite different. And I think the, the overarching thing that this whole pro project is showing me is um, th like that they're both these human beings, you know, like it's so easy to sort of just give people this list of identities and be like, she was this and this and this, and she was this and therefore this, but they have this friendship. And if you just read the correspondence, it's just, they're just bringing their lives into one another's orbits in their writing every single day. And it's, you know, letters that they type or handwrite. And so there's the beauty of that too, of what things used to look like and the stamps and stuff. And um, the Bessie Head, because she's quite famous in, a, in her way, a lot of scholars have used this correspondence, but it's never been presented with the other figure. It's like everything they've learned from this correspondence, but it's as if the Betty Fradkin, who's not famous, as if she didn't exist. So I like the idea of the relational element of it and how there's never just kind of one person, no matter how stellar they are, they're always in relationship to all these other people. 
Um, so I want to, that's the thing I want to reveal right now. Awesome. Sounds like a really fun project and something that you've been working so diligently and I can't wait for you to finish that up and eventually purchase it one day and check it out. So thank you. I'll lend it to you. <laughs> I'll just send it to you as a gift, but yes, thank you. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being part of Career Book Club this month and being our January guest. Um, we're going to go ahead, drop a link real quick in our description of how you could find out more about Jennifer and her books and films. And thank you so much for coming by. Thank you, Mikey, as well. If you haven't already, drop a like. That helps other viewers like yourself look for content like this on YouTube. If you haven't already, sub consider subscribing and drop a comment if you've actually even read any of Jennifer's work. And we look forward to seeing you in the next video. Take care, y'all. Bye. Bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you.